Mr. Nelson, would you come front and center, as they say? I've asked Brother Nate to just come and exhort us a few minutes before we receive our offering today. <coughs> I, uh, I, have the, I have the blessing of spending many Tuesday nights at the Greb's house. Um, and there's one thing about the Greb's house, there's, there's always more sugar there than, than a diabetic should have in front of him. Um, and a, a week or so ago, I was over there, and uh, there were some brownies or cookies, I don't remember, but they looked really good, and I decided that I was not going to be a good diabetic, I was going to be a bad diabetic and have, uh, have myself a brownie. And I told Jason, I'm, I'm a bad diabetic tonight. And he looked at me, and he says, well, I guess... I guess that's, that's a step in the right direction because at some point, you got to just stop calling yourself a diabetic altogether. And I went, yep, yep, you're right on that. Um, and I just want to talk today about, about stuff that God is doing, um, but it's all a result of what he's done 2,000 years ago. Um, this just overlaps what Pastor Ron was preaching last week, and it, I just wanted to build on that for a minute. Um, as, as many of you know, that my, my dad has gone through an intense physical struggle this year. Um, he had a blockage in his intestines that um, didn't get treated for many months, and it caused him to become completely, um, but he was at death's door, um, just physically wasted away because food was not passing through his system. Um, he got through that um, three times. He was supposed to die. He lived in all of those times. Um, he credits that to the power of prayer, and he thanks all of you guys for that, um, for the support that Harvest gave him during that time. When they removed the blockage, they found um, cancer in, in there, tumors in that blockage. And so they did a CAT scan and found that there were spots on his liver. Um, and he was, he was taken aback for a day, and then he said, you know what? God has healed me. I've seen him healed me. Um, the signs may look like there's cancer there, but I'm going to believe that God has healed me of it. Um, and so he and, he and my stepmom have, have started reading the word on healing as much as they could. And she's actually put together um, a letter that, that she said that God gave to her for the body. Um, and I'm going to share part of that with you today. Um, it's got about 40 passages on healing in there, and she just runs them all together as if it's one single monologue. Um, if anyone wants a copy, I've got about 10 copies back there. Uh, if you get done and, and there aren't any more and you want some, just let me know and I'll print out some more and bring them next week. Um, but I'm just going to read this for a minute. God has been showing us through his word so much about his healing power and provision. I would like to share with you what we've learned. First, we had to make the leap from, yes, God is able to heal, but will he? Through a variety of sources, we kept seeing healing as part of God's ultimate plan for redemption of man. Over and over, we saw wholeness as God's ultimate plan and purpose for us to walk in. He paired up sin and sickness in these scriptures to show us that we don't have to be in bondage to the God of this world, who is Satan. Um, as I go through this, she's got um, scripture passages. like She's quoting the Bible throughout and putting the references in there. I'm going to skip over those for the sake of time, but, but virtually everything in here is straight out of the word. All sickness is a curse, and we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We have been rescued and delivered from the domain of darkness, Satan's power, and transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Satan and all his sickness symptoms have no power or authority over us. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. God is love, and it is not his will to see his people suffer in sickness. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is no sickness in heaven, so God's will is being accomplished already in heaven regarding sickness. Let it be so on the earth. He is not trying to teach us something through sickness, although we know that in all things God does work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. He will bring good out of what Satan meant to bring destruction. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Our right and privileges believers bought by the blood of Jesus is to have abundant and full life in Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God points to life. We have the living, pulsating, glorious power of God flowing through our veins. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. He promises us life. 
But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Life, life, life. God's promise is for life and health and wholeness. He has given each of us all the faith we will ever need to believe it. We are each given a measure of faith, and even the small of a, smallest bit of it, the size of a mustard seed, will be enough for a body to be healed. If we believe that God's word, all of it, is true, then the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We do not need to be conformed to this world, but can be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. She goes on for another three pages, and I'm not going to read all of that right now, but she talks about how um, a lot of times when, when we've believed, the symptoms still look like they're there. Um, we got to walk in faith on that. Walking in faith, if we can see it, it's not faith. Um, if it looks like you're healed, um, then... You, you don't need faith for that. You're, you're simply walking in truth. Um, walking in faith, it, 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 you got to look like you need it. you got to look sick. Um, but the Word of God still says that you're healed. So the outside says, yeah, this is bad. But the Word of God says, this is good. It's already done. Um, when Jesus was uh, walking with his disciples, they saw a blind man who had been born blind from birth. And Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus, was this man born blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? Which shows a little bit of ignorance because if he was born blind, he really hadn't sinned yet. Um, so the only answer there could have been his parents. But Jesus said neither of these things was the case. This man was born blind so that the works of God might be revealed in him. The glory did not come in the man's blindness. The glory came in the fact that that blindness was healed by Jesus. This negative thing was there that I can show glory. Um, so many people think, well, God's just teaching me a lesson in this. No. The lesson is he healed you. He, he healed it. He took care of it. He paid for it. He shed his blood, and he was beaten and whipped for your healing. Um, so I'm here to tell you today that I've been healed of diabetes. Um, I, I, I really have. And, and I started proclaiming this the other day, and I, I still take my blood test. And um, I had an 86 the other day, um, right after a time of, of being in the Word. Um, that's the lowest it's been since March. Um, normal, is, normal is anywhere between 70 to 100. Diabetic is normally 100 to 140. And it was, it was 86, right there in, in normal ranges. Um, I've also been healed from sleep apnea. Um, and I have um, people who can attest to this because if, if any of you have heard me without my machine in the last number of years. If I'm snoring, if I fall asleep, it used to be that if I fell asleep before you, you were not going to sleep. It was simply not going to happen. Um, we, we had a KOA camping trip years ago, and Rico wanted to come sleep in my tent. And he did, and then he left. Um, a couple of hours into it, he said, I'm out of here. And he went, he went back and slept with his folks. Um, but that was, it was, I, for years I've been tied to this machine. And a little while back, um, I was getting ready to replace some of the tubes on it. And um, they, were, they were getting old. And, and God just said, nope, you're done with it. I said, okay. Um, and so I stopped using it and I started recording myself at night. I'd leave my phone by my bed and just hit it on record. And nine hours would go by and not a sound. Um, I've slept at the Burchettes. I've slept at the Recities. And... No, no snoring whatsoever. Um, and I was, I was snoring even way before I got diagnosed with sleep apnea. Um, I've got toes that have been crossed my whole life, and they're, they're starting to become uncrossed. Um, God is good, and these bodies are his, and we are the body of Christ now. Um, and he does not allow sickness in his church, but we've got to stand on that and believe it. Um, his part was to go to the cross to get scourged, to have a crown of thorns put on his head. Our job is to believe that he took care of it. Um, and with that, I meant to do this earlier, but go ahead and, and prepare yourselves. We're going to take the offering now just out of thanks for what he's done. Um, I'm going to pass it over to back, back to Ron, Pastor Ron so I can help Todd with that. Um, but just, just stay with that, that 
this word is given to us that we might have promises. This word is not simply a book. It is the breath of God. It is life. It is the life to us. John says that Jesus was the word. He's in there, and he is in us. The word is in us. He is in us. That healing is in us. And I just wanted to continue hammering on that while we've, while we've got that going on. Thanks. Sure, I'll pray over the, I'll pray over the giving. Father God, we just thank you today. We thank you so much for your word of promise, for your word of healing, for your word of life and glory. We thank you that when we're healed, you get glory from it. We're, we're thankful that you have given us the role of being your body, of being your messengers, of living a life that is above and beyond, that is freed from the curse of the law. Um, that those sicknesses in this world, it is not part of us because we are not of this world. And greater is he who is in the world than he... Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And that's you. And we just thank you for that. And we thank you for these amazing promises. Father, we just ask right now for, as, as we give to you, um, that you would bless this tithe and offering, that, that it would help your word to go forth, and that it would be blessed, Lord, as, as a seed time. Um, that in these, in these times of financial trouble, we would look to you as our provider, not just of health, but as financial security, Lord. That that doesn't come from our jobs, but it comes from your power and the fact that you own this whole earth and everything in it. And we are joint heirs with Christ of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job. Todd, I'm going to give you this as well. Let's make a habit in the new year to take an envelope and put our accurate address at the beginning of the year so those of us that are doing the bookkeeping can make record of whatever changes may have happened this past year or the fact that we didn't have it accurate or whatever the case. Write out your full address on an envelope this year as you give, and then we can get record again in an accurate way of every family that gives. Praise God. I can attest I walked up the stairs when Nate was sleeping, and I did not hear any snoring. That was awesome. God's good. Men of Integrity books are in for the new year. Men, make sure you grab one. There's still maybe a dozen left back there. Thank you, Jesus. I'll give a few announcements while they're finishing the offering up. Our midweeks begin again this Wednesday, January the 8th. I don't know what the weather's going to be like. Unless you hear something different by way of email or text, we will have a midweek. I know it's getting cold. A cold day or two here is coming that's going to be real frigid. The kids are believing for a snow day, I'm sure. Um, But uh, keep keep staying tuned on that. I believe Arden Harrell will be teaching this Wednesday, the adults, while Genesis Youth Group begins... Uh, again for the new year. The ladies will be, uh, I believe, unless you hear differently, Tuesday at 10 a.m., correct? So you got an email about that. Um, I'll be in Pittsburgh this week, the first week or so of the month of January and the beginning of the new year. I try to get away, bring my books, bring my study material, pray and seek God, and I'd appreciate your prayers for me as your pastor during this week as I'll be praying for you too and so it'll be I'm trusting the Lord to get there because it is a little bit of a drive down the turnpike and Cleveland has ways of telling you it's there Uh, so I'm trusting God on that there's also something coming up from Kate McVeigh Ministries it's a monthly uh, winter seminar that she does and there's some flyers in the back along those lines that we encourage you to get. Jason and Rachel, good job. You made it here on a crazy day. I had people that were texting and calling me from from well, well, shorter distances that said, I'm not coming to church today. It's good to see you guys. Let's turn, if you would, with me now to the book of Proverbs. I want to wish you a happy new year if we didn't get to as well. I'm excited about this year. How about you? A lot of people in the world are not as optimistic as I am. Some are worried, some are confused, and some are 
even in prophetic ways, is saying that maybe uh, gloom and doom of this way and that, but I know who I have as my Lord, and that's what I'm focused on. The Bible says for me to look unto Jesus, not to look to the world. The world is going to going to fluctuate greatly, and, and things could get worse in our country. But I still look to Jesus because he's the one that's my Lord, so I'm set up in a different government. And I'm not disobedient to my government. I still follow the laws. I still look at speed, speed limit signs and pay my registration and insurance, things like that. But I have a higher king, amen? And so I encourage you, this is going to be a good year. And as I was praying about what to preach on, I, I sometimes use the first Sunday of the new year uh, and talk vision, but I just felt like this Sunday I would give you some encouragement for the new year. So I want to talk to you a little bit about something out of the book of Proverbs in chapter 15 and in verse 13. It says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. I found an observation. I'd like to ask you about this. Have you ever been to a party or a visit or an event that made you laugh? Laugh so hard that you cried. Raise your hand if that's happened to you. Hopefully it's happened in the last six months. I know this past year, I don't remember exactly if it was this year or last, but I had my anticipation up to go see a movie and it was called The Three Stooges. And I, I didn't have too high of expectation because you can't beat the original Larry, Moe, and Curly. You know what I'm saying? Okay, you, you can't come close with whatever. Uh, the, is it the Farrell brothers that, that did that? I, don't, I forget uh, whatever their names are. But um, when I got into the theater... What was shown on the screen was hilarious, but what was sitting near us was even funnier. And it was this one guy who would laugh at just about everything that happened. I mean, stuff that wasn't even funny. <laughs> He's just bellowing out laughing. And I started laughing at him without even caring about what was on the screen. And then what was on the screen was laugh was funny. We laughed twice as hard. And I came away from that just feeling like that movie was amazing. But then when I saw it the second time, it, was, it was, wasn't that great. <laughs> I mean, it was good, but it wasn't as good as when I was with that guy. Man, can you come back to my house? <laughs> just... But there's something that they're finding out scientifically that takes place when we laugh. It's funny how things that science is finding out is catching up with what the Bible has always said. Science is trying to catch up to what God has put on this earth. Science is finding out things that happen uh, like hormones and, and endorphins and different things chemically released through what we go through that affect our moods, that affect our, our feelings, that affect our strength, things like that. Whenever you go through an event that makes you laugh, it makes you feel good, and you say to yourself, I need to do that again, whatever it is. It could be a couple or a family or an event that you go to and you say, I'm going back to that. Or when can we visit and meet up again? Because that's part of what brings us health. And Proverbs 15 says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. Turn to chapter 17 now. It says, as we have read before, In verse 22, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. I'll start and preach more on the front part of that verse than the back. Though we know the effects of the second part, I want to center on the first. The merry heart that God can bring us through the joy of the Lord will be medicine to us as well. We believe in a healing covenant. We believe that what Nate said and what God has given us in his word is, is promises that we should say yes and amen to. But there's some things that we have to also understand about the soul, about that part of us that needs to stay light and joyful. Can I hear an amen? I think we need to make a quest for that. We need to keep joy as essential to our health in 2014. And I'm notorious as one that has not 
always had that sort of a countenance. I happen to be a third child of four, and I'm a pretty serious soul, as they say. Uh, I take my job serious. I take life seriously. And sometimes I think I take things too serious. Tony Cook, who's a dean of Rama, back when I was going to school, he said this in his recent book that he authored. He said, some folk are just too serious. They need to lighten up. And I think I'm, I might be one of them. He said, sometimes people are, who are moody and disagreeable are just not pleasant to be around. And I don't want to be like that. I want to be someone that people like to be around. I believe the Lord was someone that we all want to be around. Amen? So the title of today's message is Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. But then another title could be The Power of, of a Contented Life. And then a third title, Showing Murphy That His Law Is Not True. See, Murphy's Law is a proposition that if something can go wrong, it will. Come on, I could preach on that for a while because some of us live that every single day. Whenever something happens in our life, that goes wrong, we say, I just knew that was going to happen. We just have this faith in Murphy that things just go wrong for us, that breaks, breaks happen for everybody else but us. And I want to refute that today. I want to refute the fact that it doesn't have to always be that way for you and that you don't always have to come out on the short end of the stick, so to speak. Amen? So turn to Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Chapter 8. And let's see what it says about joy. The book of Nehemiah. We know that there's something about joy that releases things. And it's funny, I've been to two different conferences in the last few years where the preachers have talked about laughter and last year, I was at a conference with a friend in Kalamazoo, and he said that the body of Christ has a deficiency of vitamins, but the vitamin that they're deficient of is vitamin J. How do you like that? That isn't even in the, the, the tables, right? What is it called? What kind of tables are we talking about? Come on, speak up. Periodic table? Vitamin J is the vitamin of joy. We have to have joy within our life. We have to have laughter. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? For the day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord's is your strength. I want you to know that you can have the joy of God and you can stop allowing Satan and other things to steal your joy. Your joy is important. God wants you full of joy. But we allow things and doings to bring us false satisfaction instead of a life that's filled with the joy of God. I want to give you a short story, and then I'll get into a few more scriptures. Back in April of 2012, we were given the keys to this building and I wish Mike Transit was here today because part of what uh, I went through, he was also a part of as we had laborers and people come in and help with the renovations of this property. Wherever you look, somebody had a hand in painting, resurfacing, stripping, uh, gutting, cleaning. So many things took place. And in 45 days, we had a goal to have Easter Sunday in this building. And somehow we got just a, a resemblance of a church as we took out the middle partitions, took out the middle plumbing, and we had kind of an ugly-looking building in here. I remember we still had cement on the floor. We had our old stage pieces. But they gave us the okay to have church on Easter Sunday. It took us 45 days, and we worked hard. And then we had a new goal, and it was just to get done as quickly as we could. I... I 
I think maybe we had Mother's Day as a hope, but there were, really weren't, it wasn't a target per se. But what I found was I would come in every single day, and, and the first thing we would do with everyone that came into work is we would gather together to pray at about 8 or 8.30. And we would pray for God's hand upon us as we worked. We would pray for skill. We would pray for energy. We would pray for especially protection, that no one would be injured. We had a lot of craziness, you know, with nails and with electricity and with the different things that come with renovation. And after that, we would ask and trust God for his grace to help us in these things. But, you know, whenever you're working with a, uh, a group of people on a job, or it could be all alone, Small irritations begin to come in, and little stuff starts to wear you thin. At first, you're all excited. You ever done a project at your house that went on way too long? At first, you're excited, and you have a vision about what you want to see and what you're going to accomplish, but after about two, three weeks, after that fourth week or after that fifth week, you start to get to where little things start to irritate you. Your patience wears thin. Your joy starts seeping away. And what I found within the first few weeks was we were coming into one of the most exciting seasons of this church's life and of the ministry that I've been a part of. And I remember Murphy's Law kicking in or trying to every morning. If something can go wrong, it will. So what I began to do as I began to contest it. And the way I would do that is if I put my screwdriver up on a ledge and it fell down, and I put it up a second time and it fell down again, by that time, usually I'm getting pretty ticked off. I would just say the word, yep. I said yep a thousand times. Because with everything that took place that irritated me, what I did was I acknowledged that that was not going to steal my joy. That that was a part of me doing a project and things were going to happen. Sometimes I hate the law of gravity because sometimes that is the thing that bugs you the most when you're trying to be clerical and trying to be efficient about what you're doing. And every time something would go wrong, I would acknowledge it and I would move on and not let it bother me. And that's something for those of us that are perfectionists, those of us that like things done a certain way. I wouldn't let anything enter in and steal the joy of what was happening here at this church. I acknowledge that it, things will go wrong. I acknowledge it may not be the devil. Sometimes people think it's, oh, it's the devil. No, I'm sorry. Don't give him credit for more than what he does. Can I hear him here? It's, it's, it's not necessarily bad luck or good luck. It's just life. Your paint spills. The things you set up all fall down. Whatever it is, it's there occasionally to steal the joy of the Lord in your life. Turn to Romans chapter 14. You may think, man, that is not much of a revelation, Pastor Ron. Was that really the, the the height of this message? Well, let me tell you, for me, when I was working for 90 days getting this church ready, that was an accomplishment. That was something that was significant because you know what I've done now since? And those of you that are laborers and that do work with your hands and do handyman type work, you've got to have this as your in your repertoire, in your back pocket, or else you'll be frustrated every day. You plumbers who do plumbing and you try to fix things, you electricians that think you've got it all together and something goes awry, you've got to have an amazing amount of patience to do these type of things, do the things that you do every single day. In Romans chapter 14, it says in verse 17 about joy. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's something that God intended for us to have as a part of the new covenant, 
And that was the joy that he would bring into our life. In chapter 15, it says about that also, in verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is something that God wants us to tap into. I remember I, I would amaze myself as we were working around here, amazed with the other men that could keep a good attitude and that would allow themselves to stay unaffected by discouragement. And we had many opportunities as we worked on this building to get discouraged. But we just kept plodding through and trusting God. And our painters did a great job. And the carpet people did a great job. And the people who did the lighting, awesome. The decisions that we made, the different people that set up the, 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 the sound system, the TVs, the children's ministry, worked in our offices. All the different things that took place, it was God's grace. But it was also God's patience and his hand upon us that we didn't fight, we didn't bicker. It was God's, it was supernatural. You know, often what we would say is, as we got in here, this is God's thing anyway. It's not ours. It's his church, and he'll provide. There were times that we'd, we'd feel as though we couldn't see things finish up or we wouldn't have enough money for this or that, and we'd trust God to provide, and he would. I remember the day that we were coming down to the final few weeks, and I had a TV that needed to go up in the, the main hallway just as a, a monitor for us to give information. And I said to myself, you probably heard me say this before, I said, I, I don't have anyone to put this TV up, so I'm going to try to do it myself. I've got the bracket. I'm not real good at these things, but I'll give it a shot. And the same day that I had made plans to put that TV up, someone called me and said, can I help you? What do you need me to do? I'll put the TV up for you. And they put it up way better than what I could have. And that's just been the pattern of what God did. When you trust him and you lean on him, he'll come through. I'm just going to encourage you today with 2014. When you trust the Lord, he's going to come through in your life. And I, this is a living testimony of what God did. For 45 days, we prepared ourselves for Easter Sunday. And 45 more days went by and Mother's Day took place. And we were given the okay to meet in this building with pretty much everything that you see now in place for us to meet with only a short time and a small amount of workers. It was, it was amazing. It was supernatural. But part of what had to be tapped into was the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord had to be our strength. Are you lacking strength today? Are you lacking energy? The joy that comes from your Savior, the joy that comes from knowing Him will begin to be your strength this year. So I had you turn to Romans 14 and Romans 15. Turn now to Hebrews, a few verses to the right. Hebrews chapter 1. I want to talk about the oil of joy just for a moment. I know some are watching by way of internet, and we're glad to have them listening. Many at their home turn on their computers, log into harvestofromeo.com, and then find the link that says live web stream. Todd, thank you for your diligence in that. We have people calling us and emailing us from really around the country telling us that they tune into the church services here. So we're excited about that. And it's because of people like Todd and Phil and, and Steve and Mike and others who have given of their time to make these technological advances. Amen? And we're not done. We're going to continue to advance as well and get better at what we have. The reason I'm using this microphone right now is because it's the one that sounds the best on the Internet, even though the one around the ear is a little easier to use. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about Jesus. Look at verse 8. 
But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. This is, this is prophetic about Jesus from the Psalms. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. We use this verse often when we talk about joy because we know that Jesus was full of joy. And he tapped into an oil of gladness. We tapped into the, the joy of, of his Lord, of his Father, and, and of the Spirit. We know that Jesus didn't walk around depressed. We know that he didn't carry the weight of the world on his shoulders, even though it all landed on him. So how could he walk around with all the weight of what he had to do and what his job was and still walk in joy? How could he know that there was devils around every corner that he had to cast out, and yet he still was full of the Holy Spirit? Because he walked in joy. He walked in joy. He took on an attitude that said, I am not going to take the, the worry. I'm not going to take the care. I'm not going to take the stress. Say this with me. I can't take the stress, the worry, and the concern. I cast it on Jesus. We have to do that daily, don't we? We have to do that daily. It says that he walked in a joy that had oil, and oil was a significant uh, parallel of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 61 now, turn back there. I know people don't do oil changes anymore, but back in the old day, uh, there's still a few people that do their own oil changes Uh, the younger generation doesn't even know what a dipstick is, I don't think. Uh, no disrespect, but th there is such a thing as needing to change the oil. Every, it used to be 3,000 miles. Now it's 5, 7, or 10 with synthetic oils that are out there. But back in the old days, you would find a big neon sign that would say oil chains or lube job. Do you remember that? And you'd go, what in the world? And young generation would not know what that is, but lubrication is really what it means. It means that, that you need the, the different crevices in your engine to have lubrication, so you change your oil. But I think Christians need a lube job. <laughs> I think the crevices of your spirit need some joy and oil because you're getting really cranky sometimes. Amen? Dry, right? And the, the joy of the Lord can bring that. Glory to God. Isaiah 61, I don't know if I told you 63, but in chapter 61, it says that he anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit to preach good news, verse 1, to the tidings of good tidings to the poor, sent him to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, open the prison to those who are bound, for proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort, look what it says, those who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, and to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for their mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness, oaks, King James says, lofty, strong, magnificent, distinguished for uprightness, amplified says, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. You're a planting of God, and God wants you to be lofted high as a tree of righteousness for him, and he wants you full of joy. He wants you to not have a spirit of heaviness, but instead the garment of praise. Amen. He wants you to have it, even though you may have gone through loss this year, even though there may have been a season of mourning. And each of us probably did attend funerals this year of someone dear to us that we lost. I can guarantee you in 2014, we most likely will suffer loss again. It's part of life. And God says you can have a season of grief, but you can't stay in that place forever. Death is a part of of this life that we have. But we don't have to stay there. Matter of fact, we can't. 
in order for God to begin to use us like he wants to, we've got to pick ourselves back up, even if we're in a temporary season of grief, and begin to see God. Bring us that spirit, not of heaviness, but the garment that we can put on praise. I had a special lunch this past year with John Waters, a good friend. Pastor John pastors the river of God. And I remember a season he went through a few years ago. A season of, I didn't know what he was, what he was going through. All I know is that he told his boy, me and my wife are done. We are so tired. We are so discouraged and so whipped. I'm going to take time off, and I don't know when I'm coming back. He told myself and Pastor Gary at the Methodist, he was taking a sabbatical, and and I was just curious. What's going on? So we waited until he got back. He was gone. And finally, God restored and brought some healing to him and his wife. His in-laws took him away, took him to a warm spot, and let God and the son do a work on him. It took him five weeks. His board didn't know what was going on but when he came back he came back with some renewed hope and two three years later maybe it's more than that maybe five years later he's still pastoring a good work here in Romeo called River of God but I had lunch with him this week not this week but this past year in 2013 I said what was it that pastor pastor John what was it that got you through so that you didn't burn out and give up. He said, praise and worship. And doesn't it say here, instead of heaviness and ashes, he will give to us by his spirit, if we will tap into it, he will give us a garment of praise, and he'll give us beauty. You know, I listened to what he said, and I said, I'm going to continue to walk in those same paths that you're walking in. We've had different, different challenges this past year. We've had different spirit of heavinesses come over us, my wife and I, to where we scratched our heads and said the same type of things. But praise and worship keeps us lubricated with joy. Can I hear an amen? God is sufficient. You may have felt a loss this past year, but allow the Spirit to do His work of healing the brokenhearted. Turn to Proverbs 12 now. Go a few chapters back from Isaiah. Proverbs 12 and verse 25. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Do you know what my wife and I have determined to do is get around people who have good words. Get around people who have encouragement. Get around people who make us laugh. Get around people that, that can stir up the joy of the Lord in our lives. You know, I want to encourage you with a few things today that you begin to to allow God to do his work in bringing you into that place again where you can be joyful and full of joy. He'll give you beauty for the ashes of things that died this past year. Here's a few goals practically that I, as you turn to Proverbs 17 again. Can I challenge you to laugh more this year? Laughing will produce things in you. It will cause there to be even in, in scientific ways, help and medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart does good like medicine. Makes medicine even better. It just has a way of ministering to your flesh. Can you not be so serious? Stress kills. Begin to enjoy the simplicity of, of the things that God's given you. Can you love more? 
Yeah, there's going to be rejection. But if you and I close our hearts to people, what kind of life do we have? We have to continue to love. And I tell you, I have people continually. You're not in my shoes. You don't know how many people I continually reach out to in the Romeo area, in Shelby, Bruce Township, Boston Township. And you would not believe how many reject the love that I give. I get rejected more than all of you probably put together. And I know that the Lord reminds me, Pastor Ron, or Ron, he's, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. Just remember that. But, but I'm, it's still me, Jesus. It's still, you know, just I'm reaching out with a card. I'm reaching out with an email. I'm reaching out with a letter. I'm reaching out with a phone call. And I get closed doors, shut doors in my face i get people that that sometimes come after me instead of responding with love and occasionally i'll get someone that appreciates something that i'll do what do i do with that do i stop loving people do i stop reaching out to people no i gotta do what jesus did i'm gonna keep reaching out i'm gonna keep extending myself i'm gonna keep loving i'm going to keep showing what the lord has given me they need to have whether they want it or not i'm going to continue to reach out to folks i got a desire to see this neighborhood reached out to if that's a proper word a few years ago in september we went to a hundred neighbors in our area and gave them a loaf of bread and an invitation and we we expected some response from that as most outreaches you hope for a response I'm not sure we got much of, a, of any response from these neighbors. But that doesn't stop me from wanting to reach them. How about your neighbor? How about the person to the left and right of you? How about the people around you? How about the people that God has put in your circle of influence? Continue to show God's love this year. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to allow rejection from one to limit me showing love to another if you don't like me that's fine somebody will so i i mean i keep knocking on enough doors somebody will and i feel the same way about harvest we may not be everyone's cup of teas but there'll be some people that do and to those we're going to disciple to those people we're going to train and minister god's word to amen and again, we have to remind ourselves, it's not just us that they're rejecting. They're rejecting anything that resembles God. Let's open our hearts again. Let's open our hearts to what God wants to do through us. Because he can change and he can restore. How about this? I, I just read one of these parade magazines. And how many of you know that the world is looking to have a good year just as much as we are. They're giving tips on how to have a good 2014. They said you need to eat a little bit better. You need to exercise a little bit more. You need to do do this a little bit. One of the things they said for you to do in 2014 was hug more. And then they scientifically proved that if you will embrace people more, it will release chemicals in your body that will cause you to have three things. They will ease fears and anxieties they will lower your blood pressure and they'll even boost your memory by hugging somebody <laughs> hug, hug give put your arm around somebody around you right now come on <laughs> how about those in your family how about those in your own house you know, sometimes when kids are young, they're easy to hug and easy to love on because they're cute. But when they get bigger than you, they're not cute anymore. <laughs> I, I, I take that back. They're, they're still cute. Moms, um, moms think anyone's cute <laughs> if it's theirs. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. But why don't you go up and shock them? Shock the ones in your family under your own roof and give them a hug when they're not expecting it. 
I just think that if you go months without a hug, you're in trouble. I know some churches, they don't feel real good about hugging. Certainly not a holy kiss. and Maybe it may be a handshake, but I don't have a problem at Harvest with the idea that we should be able to love each other with hugs and affection. Amen? And if people reject it, that's fine. We're going to still reach out. One determination I have for the new year, and I'm going to encourage you about this, is to stop worrying about what other people think. Proverbs says, the fear of man brings a snare. If all you're doing is thinking about what you think everyone else thinks, it's just one big old trap. Most of the time, what you're thinking they think is just a supposition. It's not the truth at all. You just conjured it up in your mind. I'm getting less and less concerned about either what I know other people think or what I assume they think. You say, are you getting cold, Pastor Ron? Are you getting a hard shell? No, I'm just getting realistic. I can't live with the worry of that. I can't go on with my life in the next year wondering if everything and everyone is happy. I'm trying to make you happy, but I may not make everyone happy in this place. I have to first make him happy. I have to first be pleasing unto the Lord. And after I do that, then I could do my best with those that are around me that God has put me in contact with. And then beyond that, I cannot live in the trap of wondering what you think. Because what you think this week might change by next week. Now I'm trapped again. <laughs> Say, but Pastor, I have some strong opinions about things you need to change. Well, that's good. Hallelujah. Pray. Because if they're godly things that you know I need to change, then prayer will send the signal to my prayer closet. And every time I'm in my prayer closet, guess what's getting brought up to me? The thing I need to change. But I'm not going to live in the fear and the worry of pleasing everyone else. It says in Galatians, how can we be a servant of Christ to serve him if we think about pleasing and serving everyone else? He's first. That's who I answer to first. Amen? You know, I begin to have a fear of my phone. You say, why would you fear your phone? I would fear my phone because people have a tendency to send emails that always come to my phone. And email has become a real easy way for people to throw out com their complaints and their frustrations and their resignations and their separations and all of their angst. And so I would look at my phone and go, oh, no, what's next? And who's mad now? And you know what I began to do? That same grace that I took on when I was working on this building, I took on the same attitude about my emails. I look at my phone, and I don't care if 10 new emails come in, and I know that five of them are people that could be mad at me. I just look at them and say, that's nice. <laughs> Jay, Jay said, delete. <laughs> No, as a pastor, I just can't do that. <laughs> it could be something very encouraging in that email. Praise the Lord. But I, I don't even open up the email without first saying, that's nice. Whatever it is you're going to say to me, however you feel, whatever you're trying to communicate, that's nice. I have a better attitude about my phone now because I'm good with whatever comes in. Because if you're leaving... Praise the Lord. God must want you in another place. If you're coming, praise the Lord. I'm happy about that. If you're giving, glory to God. I'm so glad to hear that God has tapped your heart that you want to give. If you're taking away, praise the Lord. I'm good with that too. I'm good with whatever comes because of the grace on me to walk in joy. 
I can't major on the minors. If they're minors and I'm majoring on them, I'm in trouble. Because there's power to contentment. Let's close with Philippians chapter 4. Paul was in jail when he wrote this, and he said, I have learned sometimes I'm going to have everything I need, and there's sometimes I'm not going to have anything, but I've learned to be content. There are some times when it's going to seem like you all, Philippians, are all doing what I want you to do, and there's going to be some times where none of you are doing anything right, but I'm going to be content. There's sometimes when it seems like, like everyone's happy with me, and sometimes it seems like everyone's upset at me, but I've learned to be content. Content in who I am in Christ. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect and regard to need, for I have learned whatever state that I am. Where are you at right now? You're at 299 East Gates. That's where you're at right now. I don't know where your finances are right now. I don't know how you're feeling physically. I don't know what's going on in your family. But in whatever state that I am right now, I can be content. Content, thankful for what God has given me. Thankful for his blessings. Contented and not striving and continuing to be in stress about what I don't have. Can I hear an amen? I've learned how to walk in contentment. So today's title was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, The Power of Contented Life and Overcoming Murphy's Law. You take your pick. You label it what you want to. But bad things aren't just going to happen to me this year. I'm expecting good things. Matter of fact, by faith, I expect and draw in good to come. Fear causes bad to come. So I use the power of faith and trust that good things are coming. Can I hear an amen? I'm not going to expect the worst to happen. Well, if the worst could happen, it certainly is going to happen to me. You need to catch yourself from saying that. Catch yourself because what you say is your expectation. And if you're expecting everything to always be like doo-doo on you, then that's what's going to come to you, right? But if you expect good, guess what's happening? What you believe, so be it unto you according to your faith. I want to believe for the good things. I'm not expecting the, the worst. I'm expecting the best. I'm expecting this building to be finished, the bathrooms done, the building to be paid off. I'm expecting the properties around us to all be exactly what God wants to happen, the two rentals or more to be rented by good folks. I'm expecting the people in our church to be happy with their walks with God. You say, you're you're an eternal optimist, Pastor Ray. Well, what did you want me to be? Oh, you need to be more realistic. When I look in here, I look at what God has planned and promised me. And I want to claim that. What he's promised me is good, so I'm going to expect the good. Grab hands with somebody next to you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get into your word today, and it may not have been as deep as last week, but I thank you that there is a medicinal quality to merry hearts because merry hearts do good like medicine. Lord, help us to have laughter on our houses again. No matter what the ages of our kids, whether they're all teens or all kids, little ones, whether they're all babies or they're all out of the house, help us to learn how to walk contentedly. That whatever state we're in, we can be content. We can have joy. Not a joy from the outside, but a joy from the inside. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength today. We thank you we're going to walk in health because we're going to have a lightness about us and not be so serious. We're going to walk in the joy of the Lord. We're going to walk in a the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. Do you claim that today? Hallelujah. Lord, I claim. Let's all stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
I don't know what the, the weather holds, whether we're going to get two more inches or 15. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to be rejoicing today. How about you? I'm glad you came and made it out on this cold and snowy day. And for those that are watching in a nice, cozy place inside their houses, that's good too. It, it doesn't bother me. 